there is a trend for the ETFs to be out buying physical com commodities like palladium, platinum, and they're going at now with great fervor the uranium commodity. So these things will start to tighten dramatically. So as these uh, ETFs are consuming or buying the actual physical commodity, if there are, are any interruptions due to COVID or strikes or anything at Global Mines, the supply disruption in combination with the consumption of these massive funds will provide kind of a perfect storm in terms of uh, commodity price squeezes. Today's guest is a supporting sponsor of Liberty and Finance. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest. Jim Peterson is a principal of Discovery Group. He's also the CEO and chairman of Valor Metals Corp. And he joins us this Tuesday, August 31st, 2021. Jim, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Hi, Dunnigan. Great to be here. Thank you. We wanted to talk with you today for an update on a couple of important topics that people who are considering investing in the natural resources space should be asking themselves about. One is about team and the other is about timing. We understand that there are many, many, many companies. Rick Rule talks about is like uh, finding a needle in a haystack, sometimes looking for the best companies within the precious metals resource space. There's a lot of them. And so finding the right team is one of the things he has emphasized with us in the past. And he talks about uh, both a proven track record of success, as well as the way that they, com they uh, complement their skill sets together and work together to get things done. Can you talk to us about why people who are investing in the natural resources space really need to be concerned about the team in which they are investing? I, I think it's the critical item, the key item, because as an investor in the space, if you live in Minnesota or Santiago, Chile, or Perth, Australia, or someplace in Canada, you're not necessarily out working in the industry, but you're investing in the industry. So effectively you're investing in the people that run the companies. And what you're hoping is that they have a track record of success and also that they've learned from their mistakes. Because I think that lots of mistakes get made in business. And if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're, you're cursed to repeat them. And so the team that you're backing through your investment in the company, you want them to be diligent, vigilant, experienced, and looking out for your best interests. So you can actually determine whether you think that they have the right stuff or not by reading their website clearly and um, comprehensively to determine whether their experience matches their current activities. So is it relevant or not? Is the experience relevant? Have they had success? Have they overcome failure? And are they the types of people that you want to back going forward? So that's the best thing to look for first. And I think that'll really increase your chances of success as an investor. One of the things I wanted to recall was when you talk to us about Discovery Group in general, uh, it isn't just uh, an individual company, it's a consortium of companies and that there are skills that are available across this group to help each other in areas of particular expertise as needed. Do you want to hit back on that again? Because it may be a while since people uh, heard that, or some people might not have heard that earlier interview with you about why having the right balance of skills and access to the experts in those various fields can come together to form that critical mass, especially for smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go to discoverygroup.ca, you can see there all the companies in our group, which is an alliance of public companies, but there's no arver, overarching boss that dictates those companies. The people that run those companies have chosen to be part of the group because of the benefits that it offers the companies and the shareholders of those companies. And we have an amazing contact network from which to draw experience. And if you go into, eat, there's something called Tombstones on the discoverygroup.ca website where we talk about all the different financings and M&A transactions that we've had over the years as a group of individual companies have had, but they're part of the group while they were part of the group. And then even just clicking on the individual company websites and going down the boards of directors, you can really see that pool of talent is available to all Discovery Group companies if they have a question, if they have a problem, if they're looking for a new hire, if they're looking for capital for a specific purpose, all those people are on the same team because they're part of the alliance, the Discovery Group. 
in addition to having the right skill sets that are applicable to the job at hand, and that's a really good point. Somebody can be expert at something and it may not be what's necessary for the specific thing, whether it's that geography or that jurisdiction or that, that uh, type of deposit or whatever they're going after. So there has to be a good match of uh, past experience that lines them up. You mentioned something kind of intriguing, but it, was, it went past quickly. You said hard lessons learned. Uh, tell us more about why uh, finding people who are in leadership positions that have learned hard lessons is also equally important to people who've had glowing successes. I think uh, challenges are great instructors and educators, and you know certainly failures are great, fantastic educators for people. And I think you just have to have the right attitude. If you get knocked down, you have to recognize why you were knocked down, what happened. So good examples would be just maybe overlooking certain groups when you're negotiating and or if you're looking to get a permit or if you're you're having to communicate with a community and early in your career you might for some reason overlook a certain group and that group may be coming back later to slow down the process or halt the permitting process for a project and if you're smart you won't let make that mistake ever again you'll really be hyper aware of all the different stakeholders in an area that are related to a project and even those that most people wouldn't think about and then you don't make that same mistake that's just one example or somebody who's taken a company public before actually gone through the listing process or some a specific type of transaction where there's certain things you can step in um you know cow patty if you're not if you're not careful and those things are only learned they're, they're really learned clearly when you make a mistake and uh, if you can recognize that mistake and overcome it. So, you know, if you skated through life with no problems whatsoever, you really wouldn't be a, a leader with breadth and depth to your experience. We talk about that in the preparedness community as well, because the future is unknown and in some extent unknowable. So we want to be have optionality and preparedness, but there's nothing like having some hard knocks that you've overcome that say, you know, it's not just have you dealt well with situations that went your way, but how have you dealt with things when things didn't break your way and how have you come out stronger and, and better prepared to face, you know, the uncertain future because of that. What about commitment? Because uh, a lot of people who are in the position of potentially investing in a company want to know how much skin in the game the actual principals in that company have, the leaders. Are they just are they just talking a good talk or are they walking the talk? Mm -hmm. Well, the beautiful thing about the Canadian marketplace, the Canadian listed companies, is they clearly lay out, there are certain websites you can go to and you can actually determine how many shares are owned by the executives, the insiders, how many options are held by the insiders, and if they have any warrants or other securities. You can see if they've sold stock recently you can see if they bought stock recently, if they traded in the market, if they are supporting it. And one thing I don't respect is when I hear people say, I'm employed by this company, so if something goes wrong, I don't also wanna own shares in this company because I'm then subject to twice the risk. And then my opinion is, then how can you ask anyone else to buy shares in the company if you are unprepared to do it yourself and you know the company better than anybody else should. And so that's a major red flag to me. So it's it's um, it's it's really easy. You can go to sedi, S-E-D-I dot C-A. Um, there's insider dot C-A. Those are ways to, to track it on the Canadian markets anyways. And you it might be very enlightening for your listeners and viewers when they look and they hear somebody talking a great game and then they they check out how much they actually own. They say, wow, this person really isn't demonstrating personal commitment to this project, so why should I? You're the CEO and chairman of Valor Metals Corp within the Discovery Group. Uh, what, can you, what insight can you give us on those criteria that we just talked about as far as you know, track records of success or applicable skills and expertise, hard lessons learned, and commitment within uh, Valor Metals Corp? Well, from a, a board of directors perspective, we have uh, a board that has experience in mineral dis acquisition, project exploration, like large scale exploration programs and discoveries in taking those discoveries from, you know, concept 
right through to, in one case, half a billion dollar sale or more than a half a billion dollar, dollar sale to a major gold company um, concept from or concept through discovery to a sale to a major uh, multi jurisdictional miner in the uranium space. So there's lots of large transactional experience, but that started from an idea and then was perfectly managed and executed all the way along. In terms of mistakes, I think that we were all subject to a real learning experience in the uranium space because this company was formerly called Kivalik Energy. It still holds uranium assets, which people are quite interested in now, but we were really um, not diversified as a company when there was an earthquake, or earthquake and then tsunami that took out the Japanese reactor fleets, or in fact, took out the coast of Japan, and then they shut down the reactors in the country, which basically sucked the sails right out of the wind out of the sails of the global nuclear sector. And so we, we got black swanned big time. And that was a major learning experience for us to diversify, um, have projects that could weather uh, a storm in a specific sub segment of the mining space. Yeah, figuratively and literally. How about commitment? Um, I personally am hyper committed to the company and have under just under 20% of all the shares, about 19.9% of Valor Metals and all the uh, insiders own shares of the company. The other thing you would want to make sure we got a chance to talk about was timing. And uh, in, in investments, this is something that people have really noticed. Like last year in 2020, during the Sprott uh, Natural Resource Symposium, that was a peak time in gold price hitting a new all time uh, nominal high, prices of mining companies hitting uh, all-time highs in many cases, especially smaller companies. People have, are sensitive to that. Investors are sensitive to the ebbs and flows of the prices in the investment uh, environment, but there's more to it, that, more to timing than just that. There's internal things going on within the industry. What do people need to know about timing that will affect their success as natural resource investors? Well, I think your audience, who I would assume would be also quite... Um, have a lot of aptitude with purchasing the actual metals. They would understand scarcity and when demand flows in, what happens to the timing of deliveries and premiums and all these different things and how close they're paying to spot prices. I mean, all these things are real tangible goods. And so that would be, um, something that can be then extrapolated to the mineral exploration sector as well because when markets get tightened and prices move up of specific commodities there's a slight lag and then suddenly the investment community kind of catches wind of this squeeze and they will pile into or they will start selling um, those people to which they'll sell like if it's an institutional salesperson from toronto They'll be phoning up all the hedge funds and telling them they need to own a uranium stock or a cobalt stock or a copper stock or a gold stock, depending upon the squeeze in the actual physical commodity. So there is that lag effect and then it really happens. And then there's a scarcity in the shares of those companies that track that space and they really can move. And in particular, uh, I know Rick's talked about uranium before and that a really good example of that happened in uh, the end of 2010. And um, I think it could really happen again here in the uranium space. It certainly, um, you know, will affect prices of companies that are exploring for palladium or platinum if those prices move up of those underlying commodities. And then the gold market is such a huge market in terms of all the companies that are looking for gold or copper for that matter, but they too get squeezed when the actual physical commodity price moves up due to scarcity um, strikes happen. And let, you know, if you're looking at social unrest in Chile, think, okay, a lot of the copper in the world is produced in Chile. Is there going to be some scarcity there? Is there going to be some interruptions in supply? In uranium, a lot of uranium comes from Kazakhstan. There's an issue over there where you read that, you know, government shuts down uranium mines due to COVID scare. You're going to see a price move in uranium. So there's these different timing aspects. Um, and you know, obviously it's cyclical, but also in the, in the um, mineral exploration space, uh, 
Canadian companies are subject to seasonality. So it's tough in Northern Canada to mount a big drill program in certain times of the year, whether it's the, you know, uh, dead of winter or the spring thaw, or there's certain times they call breakup. So that may affect um, the work they can do, thus the news flow. So you have to look at, and the same might be said for other places in the Southern hemisphere, far down the Southern hemisphere, or in Brazil, let's say if there's a rainy season in the rainforest, that will affect a couple of months worth of work. So all these different things, you know, you have to really understand timing is critical. I think you want to go long, actually, when there's not a lot of news flow and you'd like to be lightening up your position uh, when there's tons of news, if it's good news, because it'll it'll create liquidity and interest in the in the company. So that that and uh, and then the last thing or uh, w one thing of many, but the last thing I would like to talk about is just policy changes global government right now, uh, which I'm sure your viewers are pretty <laughs> knowledgeable on, but, you know, they're really pushing ESG policies. And, um, and so it's, it's even causing changes in the behavior of the naming of companies where they'll want to have ESG in a title of their corporate name or, um, you know, really focused on that or tying it back in to, um, you know, battery metals and uh, electrification strategies. And so all these things um, are, are going to affect the individual commodities, depending upon how they're used in electric cars, vehicles, uh, transmission of electricity. Um, you know, nuclear will definitely benefit now in terms of a policy perspective. I think that is now seen as a very low carbon footprint method of generating electricity. So that may have some impacts there. On the PGE or palladium and platinum front, you know the the real purpose, um, the the driver economically of from a commercial perspective of those metals currently is to be used in catalytic converters, so to reduce noxious fumes in automobiles. So if policy changes in China get stricter and stricter and stricter, and it isn't electric vehicles that are currently being mass produced, but rather ones that consume petrol. Um, then they will need catalytic converters in greater supply and they'll load more PGEs like platinum and platinum into those catalytic converters in those engines. So th th those are policy changes that drive. So timing can be beautiful and timing can be terrible. And that's, you know, that kind of goes back to what I was saying on that, um, the Fukushima incident, how we got sideswiped and black swaned and, um, you know, so it cha it now changes the way we do business going forward. But on the policy changes, it can also be a boon to investors if they're very long a cobalt stock. And then suddenly you hear that there's no more exports of cobalt from Africa and you're an owner of a company that has a cobalt producing mine, you will benefit. From the standpoint of potential investors in Valor Corp, are there particular elements of what you just talked about on timing that would favor this season or that people should look forward to an opportune time to get, get their foot in the door with Valor? Yeah, there's a few things on the news flow front. There has been some slowdown in assays globally. So when companies like ours drill holes or take rock samples or soil samples, we pack them up, we have chain of custody, we send them off to the labs. And if the labs are not busy, we get the results fast. If the, the labs are really busy or they're ha having trouble finding employees, which is happening all over the United States right now, it's happening globally. Um, so if they're kind of short on employees to run at full capacity, that just slows down the timing of the receipt of the assays. So we were subject to that in Brazil this year. We weren't last year. We we're actually getting results really fast, but this year it slowed down a bit. And that's all kind of starting now. So we, we've been doing work for several months and sending uh, these results off, these samples off for the assay results, and we're just starting to get them. So news flow for us now will really pick up for the latter half of the year, which is fabulous for investors. And then um, in terms of uh, trends, uh, I've seen it right now where there is a trend for the ETFs to be out buying physical com commodities like palladium, platinum, and they're going at now with great fervor the uranium commodities. So these things will start to tighten dramatically. So as these uh, ETFs are consuming or buying the actual physical commodity, if there are, are any interruptions due to COVID or strikes or anything at global mines, the supply disruption 
in combination with the consumption of these massive funds will provide kind of a perfect storm in terms of uh, commodity price squeezes. Jim, if people want to find out more about Discovery Group or about Valor Metals Corp, where should they go? Discoverygroup.ca for Discovery Group and ValorMetals.com. We've been speaking with Jim Peterson, the, the CEO and chairman of Valor Metals Corp here again on Liberty and Finance. Jim, on behalf of our viewers, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Don, again.